Um, thank you, Professor Norman, for joining us today. You're quite welcome. But you have you have to recognize you have to recognize that the book it was first called the psychology of everyday things was like every new radical product that comes into the market. So um, lots of lots of my friends have startups and they they ask me for advice and they're going to revolutionize the world. And you know it may be true, but even if your radical new idea is successful, it takes decades for it to happen. So. When you're doing a startup, don't try to do something that breaks the boundaries because uh, you need deep pockets. So I'll give you two stories, and it's relevant to your introduction. The first story is when I first joined Apple, um, they were gonna bring out a new product. I had nothing to do with it because I had just joined, and I saw, wow, what a great product. It's gonna revolutionize the world, I said. And they released it, and it failed. They released a second version, and it failed. They released a third version and it failed, so they gave up. So most of you probably don't even know that Apple made one of the very, very first commercial digital cameras. A camera that didn't require film. So I said it was gonna revolutionize the world and was I wrong or right? Well, I was right. I was simply 15 years too early. You see, when that camera came out, the world wasn't ready for it. It, it first of all, could only take about eight pictures. That's all its memory could hold. Second of all, but, but by the way, film, which you may have to explain to your class, film, <laughs> film only held about eight pictures in those days. So that wasn't the problem. You couldn't see the picture you'd take it. There was no display, but that wasn't the problem because no camera had displays. The, the real problem was when you got the, took the picture, what did you do with it? It was a mess to get it into your computer and then it filled up the entire memory of the computer. And so the whole point was you're supposed to send it to somebody else. So what you would do is you would take your old-fashioned telephone and you would dial the number of the person you wanted to give it to and you would put it on these suction cups and it would send audio tones at 300 baud. Now you don't know what the word baud means, but think of it as 30 bytes per second. 30 bytes, not kilobytes, not megabytes. <coughs> Technology wasn't there. It took years. We also didn't have inkjet printers. You couldn't print it out in color. So too early, so the psychology of everyday things comes out. Today is a classic, sold, I don't know, 800,000 copies or something. It got reviewed in the New York Times, the book review, who said, this is the stupidest book I've ever had, the misfortune to read. The person doesn't know what he's talking about. I can't imagine why anybody would ever be interested. And the New York Times was polite they buried the review in the back, so not too many people saw it. And sales took a while. It did take, I don't know, five to 10 years before, oh, maybe there's something in here. And, and meanwhile, by the way, marketing, the psychology of everyday things, would you buy that book? I mean, first of all, where was it? In the psychology section? People go to the psychology section of the book to learn about why their mothers hate them or something. <laughs> 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 uh, the, the publisher refused to issue a, a paperback, and my literary agent managed to convince Doubleday uh, to, because that editor saw something in the book. And the Doubleday put out the paperback. And the editor said, What a stupid title! It's a design book, call it the design of everyday things. And I said, No, I love psychology of everyday everyday things, P-O-E-T, poet. And the editor said, she said, yeah, you're a stupid professor. You just love these cute things. You don't understand sales. And she was right. Um, I actually did, I did like I asked people to do. I went to the bookstores and I talked to the clerks and I talked to people and I asked them about the titles. And everybody told me psychology of everyday things was a stupid title. So started off the day with, first of all, Great new ideas, most of them fail. Most innovation is incremental. We take what we have, we make it better. 99% of innovation is incremental innovation. Over the years, that's really important because it adds up. And radical innovation, which is what all of us want to do and change the world, how many of those are you going to experience in your lifetime? Just a couple. 
I mean, even if it's 100, that's not very many over your lifetime. Most radical innovations fail, and the ones that do succeed take decades. RCA introduced color television, and they lost money for like 10 years, but they had enough money that they could continue to support it until it finally caught on. Thank you for your introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, for supplementing it so thoughtfully. Um, so how do you think that um, the student of design or the, the student in general, somebody who's um, early in their career, what happens is they make this transition from wanting to build big, huge, groundbreaking things to understanding that, at least on a week-to-week, month-to-month basis, it's this incremental thoughtfulness, these small things that accumulate that really create, um, you know, immediate relevance and commercial successes. I mean, what is that? What do you think that process? You've taught a lot of people design. How do you think that process looks, and how do we put ourselves through that process here? Well, actually, you know. Most people, when they graduate from the university, have great inflated uh, desires. You graduate as an architect and you want to build these massive structures, and you spend all your day in a great big office with 50 other architects designing wiring runs or plumbing. <laughs> or, and um, your MBA students, you all want to be general managers or CEOs, and you're going to be a, a midline manager. Uh, you just have to work your way up and you have to realize it's the small incremental things that really do matter and um, there can be a challenge by the way that if you if when you're asked to design something there are lots of constraints and one of the constraints is the established base and it's very rare that a designer gets a chance to start from nowhere from nothing to say here's a blank piece of paper do it um, Almost always there's an existing product line and you, oh, you can't make it too much different or your customers will rebel. And, um, or even if you're bringing in a new, you're going to make a new coffee pot, <laughs> coffee maker, well, of course there are a bunch of existing ones. So you have to tread the space between the existing ones. And uh, it's a difficult job and it's a challenge. Now I suspect that all of you in the class are not going to be designers. Um, I was, I ran the Triple M program at uh, Northwestern. Triple M used to stand for Masters in Manufacturing and Management. Um, and it was an operations program taught by the engineering school and an MBA program taught by Kellogg and you ended up with two degrees. Um, I took over the engineering side, but operations wasn't needed anymore because the business school had good operations people. So I switched it to design. And um, so my students ended up with courses in design and an MBA from Kellogg and et cetera. That's become a very popular program now. And if you look to see where those graduates are, one or two ended up in design companies. So one of my very first graduates, I got a job at IDL, which was oh, a dream job for everybody. And the way you got the job at IDL though, was saying, I'm not a designer. He didn't pretend to be a designer. He said, but I understand the process of design and you guys need people who understand business. And that's where the, that's where the jobs are. The jobs are management, where you can be managing the design team or managing the company and saying, hey, you know this design thinking stuff. Well, design thinking is a strategy. It's strategic. It ought to be part of the governance of a company. Because what design thinking is doing is stepping back and saying, what are the real problems we have? So you, you, you asked about incrementalism. Um, a problem with incremental is we have this product, we've released it, uh, it's now, you know, sales are going down, competitors have come in, what can we do to increase the sales again? We go out and we try to what designers would say, go out and look at your customers and see where their issues are and, and refine it. But you're, you're li relatively limited. Um, actually, I'm tempted to go in two directions. There's a wonderful book by a woman in the Harvard Business School about, um, I'm trying to remember her name, she's Korean. Um, but the, the point was, what most people, most designers do and most marketing people do is they take a look at 
a product and they look at all the competitors' product and they say, oh, there are 26 features in competition and, you know, 25 in ours and there are six features in the competition that we don't have, so we must add those. And that's a disaster strategy. When you don't have the same features as your competition, don't try to catch up. Because all that does is make your product look just like theirs and there's no differentiation. What you should do is look at the features you have that nobody else has that are, or the features you have that are better than everybody else's and make them even better. Because you need to be different. Now, back to the incrementalism. I argue that what you guys ought to do is not get, not just stick in the design department, which is always kind of in the middle of the company and is never going to go up, where you actually don't have that much say. Someone else decides what product to make and then your job is to what? Make it? No, you want to be the group to say what products to make. And that's where the design thinking approach comes in, where you say, what's the real problem with our company? What's our real strengths? Uh, what's our core competencies? You know, the standard story, the core competencies. How do we differentiate ourselves? Not how do we catch up with the others. How do we make ourselves different from the others? And what's the fundamental problem we're trying to solve? And uh, <clears throat> that might be a good segue to one of the things that's profoundly different about the practice of design as opposed to the traditional marketing techniques that, that a lot of students learn here, especially in their first year, is the focus on starting with the individual instead of starting with aggregates um, in the practice of design. What yep. do you think it is about our, our emotional wiring or our habits or the history of business that makes it so that we have to reteach people to focus on the individual? <laughs> it's not in our wiring, it's the uh we become obsessed with numbers. And uh, MBA school is one of the culprits where uh, if it isn't measurable and you can't put it in an equation, it's no good. And the economists have ruled the days. And the economists are so logical, so sensible, it's just that they're wrong. And um, no one notices they're wrong because, you know, I, I say this to designers who complain that, uh, they can't convince management. Ma the designers have this wonderful idea and they try to pitch it to management and management won't listen. And I say, well, how do you try to sell it? They say, we explain to them how valuable it is and how people love, uh, you know, our products and, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I say, forget it. I mean, first of all, management knows you're good. That's why they hired you. They're not, they're not interested in you telling them that. They're not interested in you giving them a sales pitch. So. What is, what is human-centered design? It's understanding the person who is using your products, right? So if you're a designer, who's your customer? <laughs> Question? What do you guys think? <clears throat> yeah, your boss. Your, your boss? <laughs> What's one take? Any other? Who's going to purchase your product? The, the buyer, the purchaser of the product. So whoever said your boss, <clears throat> give them an A. <laughs> it, right. Most designers say they're, they're trained to think that it's a customer who matters. No, it's actually, it's actually not your boss. You're close. It's the boss of your boss. <laughs> and so, and if you're working in a, in a um, if you're working in a consultancy, then when I say, when you're given an issue to, to help the company with, your job it's actually not to make the best product. Your job is to get your client promoted. Because it's your, what does the company care about? Sure, the company wants wonderful products and wants, but in the end, what they care about is profits. And so your job is to understand the business of the company and try to help the company be successful. And it's, it's amazing how many workers of all levels, uh, because, you know, at Apple, I had 250 people working for me. I was vice president of advanced technology. And my people were dedicated and really excellent. And they all thought that whatever they were doing was the most important thing in the world. But, but why else would they do it? Very, it was the rare person who would step back and say, what does this matter for the company? 
And I went and I talked to the engineers, to the software people, to the marketing people. So I really went across the company and it was amazing how most people just thought of their own narrow little thing they were doing. And you could tell the people who were going to be the future leaders. It was the few people who stepped back and looked at the big picture. But that's what design training should give you. That's, and actually, well, that's why I'm so pleased that design training comes into MBA courses, an MBA school, because it gives you, the, gives you the breath to step back and say, what I care about is the company and its success. So what is it that, say, design can bring to this? Now, the question was about the difference in part between designing and marketing. In design, we really say, what are the fundamental needs of the person that's eventually going to use this? In marketing, we tend to look at, we tend to use questionnaires, surveys, um, other kinds of data. Um, there's, a, there's a reason for the difference because we are trying to satisfy the real needs of the person. Marketing is concerned with what people buy and those are not the same things. So we buy for all sorts of reasons and probably all of you have experienced this. You may have gone into it, you want to buy an automobile, you want to buy some fancy appliance and you've do done your research, you go into the store or the dealer knowing exactly what you want and you end up with something different. So what caused that? Well, you just saw this and it was just really nice. Or you saw what you had done the research on and there's something about it that just didn't excite you. And uh, so what we buy is not what we need necessarily. But once we've bought it, then the importance of satisfying the needs comes out because that's what determines whether you recommend it to your friends and the kind of vibe comes out, and the kind of you know, informal network. So both of these are important. And the fact that we use somewhat different methods to find them, oh, perfectly reasonable perfectly reasonable. So I, I always get upset when people argue about which method is better because I say, well, why are you using it? What is the purpose of the method? Sales, satisfaction. There is one more thing though. One thing I don't like is um, looking at social economic class, the sort of the type, the traditional way we divide up consumers. Uh, I believe the correct way when you're designing something is don't look at how old they are, don't look at how much money or education they have, look at what activities they want to do. So you want to sell a car to old retired folks, what do you want to sell them? Take a look at what they do. Because first of all, when you are old and retired, you do not feel old. <laughs> Basically, you say, you know, I've always wanted this hot rod when I was a teenager, or I wanted this sexy car, and I wanted to be able to go out and drive and sleep in the car and have sex in the car. But I was busy, didn't have enough money, and I couldn't do it. And now, finally, my kids are out of the house. I have money, I have time. That's what I want. <laughs> How do um, so you, 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 you did a great job talking about? how designers should approach business people. These are, you know, our, our students here are students of business. And <clears throat> as you mentioned from your prior experience, most of them will go on to be managers, managers of uh, general areas. And, but they'll all, we all work with designers today in some fashion. How do you think they can best prepare themselves to get the most out of their design colleagues and the design investments that they make over the course of their career? Well, first of all, when you manage designers, <laughs> good luck. Um, <laughs> it's amazing, designers, uh, the traditional design education, that's starting to change. The traditional design education is in art and architecture schools. And uh, one of the things they sort of are taught is that business is evil and, uh, and managers are stupid. Um, actually, professors think the same thing. Professors think that uh, they're uh, provosts and they're deans and are stupid and you would why would anybody want to do that etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, it's sort of a common feeling by the way the higher up in the organization you are the lower the p lower level people don't, don't don't understand they think you're stupid why are you making such stupid decisions didn't you understand 
And um, but designers have that in, really, they really have it strongly. Uh, by the way, the real issue, the reason that you think it's stupid, in my opinion, is because uh, professors don't understand the economics of a university. Um, and they don't understand the kind of constraints and difficulties that their executives, their deans and their provosts and the president have to try to make the university balance that, yes, you have to satisfy the students, yes, you want to produce great graduates, yes, you want them to get good jobs, but, you know, there is that budget. <laughs> And you do have the balance of budget in the end, and that has all sorts of, of real constraints. And uh, almost usually the people in the lower parts of any organization are insensitive to that. And they don't understand the sales pressures in a, in a manufacturing company, for example, or the manufacturing problems or the labor union issues. And um, by, not, by not taking the broader view, you therefore think that Gee, I just presented this great argument. I did this great thing and it got rejected. Stupid management. Instead of backing off and say, well, again, was this going to help the company be more profitable? Uh, what are the issues? Um, when I reminded me of something I wanted to say, but I'll save it for later. The, the issue is, though, when you manage designers, you want to get their creativity, but you also have to channel it into things that are going to work for the company. Um, in the, I don't know if you've read the Design of Everyday Things, but the new edition. They have. They have. It's a sign of the In the back, the last two chapters, I talk about the issues of real design. Um, that, and I talk about this double diamond approach, which is designers like to spend the first few months figuring out what the real issue is. And it drives managers crazy. You know, uh, management comes down from up above and says, Voom, we need to re revive our line for the Christmas rush. And here it is, it's February, which means that we better have the stuff ready. Well, we have to start marketing it to our distributors in when? Um, August, September, and it has to be, the manufacturing has to start around then if, if, if it's a hardware product. So you don't have that much time. And um, so you go to the, your design group and you give them the charge and they say, wonderful, we're gonna go out and we wanna study our customers in India and, and in Europe and we wanna understand what they really need and see what the issue is with the current products. And you say, yes, that's an excellent thing to do, but we don't have time. <laughs> and they say, we have to do it. How much time do you need? Oh, six months. <laughs> uh, and you say, well, how about two weeks? <laughs> and you have this big fight about how much time. And so you finally compromise on one month to finish the design. Okay? So you go away. And you come back in a week. And you say, show me your progress. And, there's, and they're all over the place. Uh, and they have no progress. And then you say, what have you been doing all this time? You got a whole week already out of your month. And they say, well, we're trying to figure out what the problem is. Well, I told you the problem. I told you what I needed. No, no, we're trying to figure it out. And um, what you have to do, though, is you have to let them do it, encourage them, say, I'm really pleased that you're doing that and rethinking the problem. But remember, the deadline is whatever, October 1st, and you've got to be finished by then. Actually, it won't be October 1st, it'll be um, March 1st. You've got to be finished by March 1st. Um, and you go away for a week, and you come back in a week, and where are you? Oh, we figured out what the problem is. Geesh, you've spent half your time, and now you just come back. I gave you the problem in the first place. Well, actually, we think it's not what you said. It's something different. But again, you have to encourage them. And you do come back the third week, and where are they? They're all over the place. Uh, you cannot see any any progress actually in this, and what they're doing is they're looking at all the possible things they might do. But if you hold them to their deadline and their budget, what usually happens? It's just what happens to all of you. When do you write your assignment paper? <laughs> you know, I, we could give you six months to write it, or we could give you a week to write it. It doesn't matter. You're going to do it the night before. 
<laughs> Does that happen here? No. Uh, like no. Okay. So what what happens is that magic happens at the very end. Uh, and they do often come through if you let them have that. And it turns out that what was happening all along wasn't wasted because it means that they really did think about all the alternatives. They really did think hard about what the issues were. Uh, and they thought about what the possible solutions were. And if they're a good design team, um, and I'll come back in a second. If they're a good design team, they understood the financial constraints, the manufacturing constraints, the install base constraints. They had also talked to potential customers, so they understood what kind of changes they would welcome and what they would reject. And so if you give them that freedom, <clears throat> you can come out with wonderful results. But let me tell you, it's unlike managing any other group. And so managers have to have a lot of tolerance for this kind of uh, vagueness and indecisiveness. Uh, it's really a messy process. When you manage an engineering group, you give them the problem on day one and they're starting to work on the solution in a few hours. <coughs> they never though ever stop to ask whether that was the right problem. But you have to be, uh, managing designers is very different. Managing creative people in general is very different. The one other comment I wanted to say was, you should never let the design group be just designers. Um, I like to have multidisciplinary groups. I like from day one, you have design team together with engineering, together with marketing, uh, and it depends on the product you actually have. But, uh, together with manufacturing, maybe service, um, all there. Now you might have a you might have ten designers in one each of the others, but you want you want as they're going through it, somebody who's pointing out who's wondering, well, I don't know if we can manufacture that, or I don't know if we could ever service that, or you know the kind of phone calls we get about the problems. It costs us a lot of money, and here's the sort of problems that they're always talking about. So that. As you go through the process, they're aware of the business components. And then as they, as they, when they finish the design, and it gets on, gets going to the next section, usually the engineering, uh, you want a few designers to stay, one or two designers to stay on the team. So now we have mostly engineers, but you still want some sales, some manufacturing, some marketing, and designers, because the engineers are going to find new issues and new problems. And if you're not, if, unless you have everyone there, they're going to in, invent their own solutions. So you want to make sure you have the representatives with the expert knowledge to help you shepherd it through. But it's, it's a challenging design, it's a challenging management problem. But it's a wonderful one because you can, you can actually revolutionize the company through effective design. When, when you're when you're managing those kind of interdisciplinary teams, what are the things that you seem to be most successful for creating an environment where, you know, the manufacturing and the support people they they're not there to have a veto; they're there to help everybody else understand what that part of the customer relationship is like. How do you how do you help create that environment as opposed to uh, you know I'm I'm vetoing this because I'm in support and I say it's going to be hard to support. The way uh, the way I've seen it work. The way I've seen it work badly is when they're, you know, that's the manufacturing guy, and this is, and they're sitting there with nothing you do most of the time, unless you have a question or whether you say, is this okay? That's, that's a horrible way. It's not good for anybody. What I like to do is say, here's the design team. Get to work. And you're all equal. And so if this works, when this works well, you don't even remember which one is the manufacturing guy, which is the business guy, which is the sales guy. They're all contributing whatever they need. And, um, you know, again, I don't like always to go back to my past life, but I will. At Apple, I was, this was where I first intro was introduced to this, where we had, it was software products. So we had um, the design team, the engineering team, and marketing. And, um, and actually, I had those people working for me in my division, and I never knew which was which. I didn't know which people had PhDs and which people had flunked out of college and never graduated. What I did know was what their skills were and how valuable they were. 
So it didn't, didn't matter. So in the product division, when I was working on, on products, it was great because uh, I remember the marketing person decided I didn't know enough about the market. And he took me on a trip to France to talk to a number of the major uh, customer sites. And uh, what, what, what the marketing people did was give me access to people all around the world to understand the world market. And, but we came back and we would debate these issues. And again, everybody would have a, a say. Some people would be more knowledgeable than others on these components. But, and what was nice was people respected their knowledge. They didn't give a damn what part of the company they were from. So if you can manage that environment, it works really well. And actually the same thing is when you say, this is gonna be hard to manufacture and people push back on you. The correct response is not to argue. The correct response is say, hey, you know, I'm gonna call up my friend, uh, Helen, who runs a manufacturing plant in Singapore. Let's go there and take a look at how they do it. And that really makes all the difference in the world when you go and you watch and you say, oh, I see. You've um, <clears throat> recently, you've been really vocal about where Apple is with their, their product line and uh, the, the pathology of styling over substance. Um, why do you think that that happens to products? And how do we keep focused on what really matters to our audience in the design process? It's hard. Every company has trouble staying focused over decades and decades and decades. And... Um, there's actually a problem with being the leader is you get cocky and you, you don't step back and, and criticize yourself. And uh, there's a lovely book by, um, I guess it was by Moore uh, from Intel. It's called, uh, basically it was about, the title of the book was what? Um, it was about paranoia. Only the paranoid survive, I think. Only the paranoid survive. Right. You should always be thinking people are attacking you and really be critical of your own work. Um, and I think Apple lost that touch. I think Apple got cocky that um, Johnny Ive came in and completely restructured the design group. So the design group was now in charge. Um, Johnny is really wonderful. I used to, used to work with him because uh, Johnny would have these wonderful ideas. And I thought they were brilliant and he couldn't get the engineering groups to accept them and come to me for help. And I would, I would trot around to all the VPs of all the different divisions and try to convince them and occasionally have to go up to the CEO. Unfortunately, we had an incompetent CEO at that point. That was Gil Emilio. Um, but uh, when jobs came in, he gave him free reign. He said, yeah, that's what we need. But the, the problem is that um, Ive is a more classical industrial designer. He's trained uh, for appearance. And so he did change Apple, and Apple obviously, has, <laughs> you can't deny it's been a success. But um, design is not a single uh, enterprise. It's like, it's like saying business uh, is a single enterprise. You go to get an MBA, yeah, but are you going to be in marketing? Are you going to be in operations? Are you going to be in sales? Are you going to be in finance? They're very, very different disciplines and require different talents, and the same with design. So uh, what they've lost was their interaction design, trying to make things intelligible and understandable. Um, and they're so good at it, though, that when I try to convince you of this, most people say, what are you talking about? I love my Apple product. They're so easy to use. Well, they're not that easy to use when you actually think about it. And when, it, when you actually you love your iPad and you love your iPhone, but I don't see you taking notes on your iPad and iPhone. I see you taking notes. There's a laptop right there. And um, because the laptops work better and they're easier to understand, and you have menus, which, hey, that reminds me of all the different actions I can do, whereas the iPhone and the iPad, well, they just came out with iOS 9, and they finally fixed some of the problems that we've been complaining about, but guess what? Uh, I just read an article in, in Forbes. It says, 25 powerful secrets in iOS 9. Well, come on, if they're so powerful, why are they secret? <laughs> 
because you have to get because they don't want to mess up the elegance by having a menu and saying what you can do here or having any hint. So you have to remember that, oh, in this one, I hit with two fingers from the middle of the screen and swipe upward in a diagonal. <laughs> That's not true, but it's kind of like that. You have to remember all these obscure things, and they've lost it. And so I'm writing an article with Todd Mazzini, um, Bruce Todd Mazzini. He was the very first user you know, interface designer at Apple. And Apple had these wonderful manuals on how to do it, and he wrote the first one, and they've forgotten those principles. And we've been reading the current manual, and the current manual isn't bad. It has all the right principles in there, but they don't follow them themselves. This is for the other people, for the developers, not for us. So I think there are, I, you know, Apple is a good company and it has really good people. And after that first critical article I wrote in LinkedIn, of all places, um, I, got, I got some private email from some of my former employees. People used to work for me when they were at Apple. They're still at Apple. And they said, thank you. We've been having this argument internally. And your, your article is going to help us. So I think Apple is because great people. And I think uh, there, there's, there are a lot of people there understand the issues. So all companies go up and down. Um, Apple has the misfortune of being so profitable <laughs> that when somebody inside is trying to say, look, our products are not as good as they could be, um, the managers are going to say, you know, we're really busy, we have this problem, we, you know, the Foxconn people are again giving problems and we're having trouble in China and we're having trouble here and there. Look, come on, stop bothering us with those trivial things. When the company starts hurting, that's when they'll pay attention. Uh, you talk about design as a process of communication and, and hence the importance of discoverability, <clears throat> which is one of the things that we've read about in the design of everyday things. Would, would you mind talking for a second about that and, and how it relates to the study of design and the introduction of design processes to the layperson? Well, yeah. I mean, design is not making something look pretty. That's an important component because we love emotionally pleasing devices. We like things that are attractive. We like things that feel well. But design really is a way of thinking. It's a way of trying to match what people need to the things that we deliver for them. And um, <laughs> one of the things that we, uh, people like is to be in control. They like to think, they, we like to think that we understand what is happening to us that we have some say in what is happening. And in some cases where we have no say, then that we have great faith and trust in what is happening. So um, why do people, why are more people afraid of flying than afraid of driving? And I think because in driving, in fact, there's lots of studies, in driving, the driver feels in control. And the driver, uh, all drivers are above average, we know that. And drivers feel that they control what's happening. And um, when they're in an airplane, though, who knows what's happening? And I look out the window, and I, and the, you know, and I we have a little bit of turbulence, and oh my God, the wings will fall off. Um, they don't feel in control. But of course, statistically, there's just no comparison. No matter what measure you use, driving is a lot more dangerous than flying. After a big aviation crash, people stop flying. They're afraid of flying. And guess what? The death rate goes up because they switch to automobiles and there are more deaths. So when, when we design things, I think one of the most important things, and that's why the discoverability and the feedback is so important, because then people know what operations they can do, and then they also know what, what is happening. And it's really good if you can undo what you've done, because especially in the computer, the undo is a very powerful operation on your laptops. I mean, how many times when you're writing, you, you try out a sentence and say, oh, that's not right, Un you know, and you undo it. It's really nice to be able to experiment that way. It's not just for error, it's for a deliberate way of trial and error writing and experimentation. But, so what we want to do is we want to provide products that increase people's Confidence. confidence in their own abilities. And that's why, that's why the communication is so important. 
two-way communication between you and the product and the product and you. <laughs> the um, okay. Well, I, I uh, before we run out of time, I want all the students ask some questions. So, um, any questions for Professor Norman in the class? No, <laughs> they've been odd. Okay, Anshu Gupta. That's you're not like MBA students. Come on, I, <laughs> I don't think I've ever given a talk to MBA classes where I wasn't interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter with you guys? They, they've been studiously reading your book. They already know everything. They're just. Um, I'm wondering how you apply this principle within like a company that has like a really strong existing portfolio. Like I worked in CPG this summer, and like every every product had like a really strong brand. So how do you apply <laughs> this principle of design thinking to a product that customers are already familiar with? So tell me, what were the, um, so if it's already a successful product and the customer is familiar with it, did you go to any of the design, any of the decision meetings, any of the management meetings? Probably not, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think the issues were facing that particular product group? Well, I was in cereal and no one wants to eat cereal anymore. <laughs> well, but wait a minute. I thought you just told me they have a well-established line, they're doing well, and now you say that nobody wants to eat cereal anymore. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just, like, nobody wants to eat it, but, like, how do you change it and still maintain bread equity? Well, that's, that's actually... See, the nobody wants to eat cereal anymore is an opportunity. But, you, but, but what you did is you approached it more like um, an engineer or a business person. You say, well, so how do we change their minds or how do we change the product? No. What's the real problem here? So let me just give you a quick survey, quick summary. When, when I hear of a problem, nobody wants to eat cereal anymore, uh, I want to know what the real problem is. So I want to know, why is it nobody eats cereal anymore? And, and when you tell me, I'm going to say, why is that? And when you tell me, I'm going to say, why is that? And that's the Japanese five whys. <laughs> they, they do want to eat breakfast, don't they? And actually, in the middle of the day, they want a snack, don't they? And dry cereal is one of the people's favorite snacks, and et cetera, et cetera. So I want to understand what's really driving this. And maybe there's an opportunity when we understand what people really are looking for. Um, to re, maybe repackage a cereal. Maybe it should be sold as snacks. So, I mean, I love dry cereal. I never eat it in the morning for breakfast, but we have it around the house and I have it at work because when I'm hungry, I just grab a handful um, say, well, you know, it's got vitamins and fiber and stuff. Now, actually, I've stopped doing that a lot because, oh, carbohydrates. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. But again, you look at that and you say, well, okay, we're going to package more, more dried fruit in this, or we're going to do this, or we're going to do that, or we're going to... Um, but again, I think when you... There is no such thing as a stable, established line. The real danger in company thinking is that, hey, we've made it, everybody loves this, we'll just keep making it forever. No. Because first of all, your, your competition is trying to change. And second of all, the world is changing. It used to be cereals were wonderful. Hey, look, no fat. Great. What we should have every morning. And now suddenly, oh no, it's carbohydrates, high glycemic count, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got to be always asking, probing. But, but take that as a challenge. A, and a challenge, moreover, where you could change the whole product line and therefore be, hey, successful young star in cereals. <laughs> Okay, other questions, Katie Owen. Sure. Um, I have a question about what you were discussing in terms of uh, <laughs> Apple's design for tablets and for iPhones and how that's not optimal for what people actually want to do and how we see that that design is actually mimicked in other companies doing the same thing. Um, and to tie that back to what you said in the beginning, people won't uh, accept innovation that's too extreme. And so seemingly it would be easy enough for people to design another interface for a tablet type uh, device, but they haven't yet and it hasn't become popular. So is it the responsibility of big companies to push innovation or can we allow for like smaller incremental development? Um, 
Actually, I would slightly restruct, restate what you said. I don't believe that um, the tablet and the phone are, are necessarily bad for the kinds of activities people want to do. I think that they could be made better, but, but in fact, when you want to write your paper, and whether it's a paper for class or if you have to write a white paper or a report or uh, do a complex spreadsheet for your business, um, these are not the right tools. And, and uh, today the best tool really is um, a laptop. And you notice that most of us, like when I'm talking to you right now, you can't see what I'm in front of, but um, I have a big screen that is that wide and that tall. It's horizontal. And now from the left, I have a big screen that's that high and that wide. It's vertical. And so I have, there's my calendar and there's my email. And this is with the, the big screen in front of me. I can have two or sometimes even three different documents that I'm working on. Right now, I only have one thing, which is a big picture of you, the class. <laughs> um, but, but of you, so you're not quite life-size, but almost. <laughs> because that makes me, well, that's, that's important. It makes me think I'm really talking to you. So I think we will have different devices for different purposes. And that um, there's nothing the matter with having a tablet when I travel and having a tablet to take quick notes, or having a tablet for my photographs and my private things or to quickly check email and, and reply for the short email. And to have a bigger machine in my office where I can have, I can afford, you know, the space to have these big displays. And you'll have to interact with the big machine differently than with the tablet. And you notice that the companies are changing too. The new release of the tablet, uh, they copied Microsoft. Microsoft has actually been the most innovative in trying to figure out how to manage the desire to have a lightweight tablet um, and also a good screen and a good uh, keyboard and to use the powerhouse applications that Microsoft makes, like Excel and Word and PowerPoint. And uh, so they developed a really lightweight keyboard, and they developed touch-sensitive screens, and they made it easy to detach the screen and just use it or put the keyboard back on. And so they, they, they messed up. They didn't do a good job in their first few attempts. Micro and Microsoft was famous for taking many attempts to get it right, and they now have, they're now at what? It's the tenth of tenth or something, uh, and it's not so bad. So the problem is they've lost to that. No one is giving them a tryout. So we'll see whether Microsoft is still the favorite vendor for business, and we'll see whether their new approach, which is trying to try to, to take the advantages of tablets and a detachable tablet with the advantage of a large screen keyboard um, when you're at your desk, we'll see whether that works. I have friends who love it, who think it's wonderful that they can um, do everything they need. They can take notes with a pen on the, on the screen, or they can type. Now, it's interesting that the new iPad copies quite a bit of what Microsoft did. Oh, isn't it interesting? Microsoft will let you do two things at once on your, on your screen. Oh, so the new tablet, iOS 9, lets you if you can remember how, swipe out from the right and add a second application simultaneously with the main application. And, oh, we're going to give you a, a little uh, scribe. We're going to give you a pen so you can write on the screen. Apple used to say, we'll never do that. Now they provide one. And, oh, we're going to give you this little fold-up keyboard that surprisingly looks very much like the Microsoft keyboard. So all these companies are innovating and experimenting and testing. Uh, but I really think in the end, we're going to have specialized uh, devices. The device I travel with will be more limited, but easier to carry and work with. And the device I work on in my office will be heavier and bigger and bulkier, but much more effective for office work. All right, other questions for Professor Norman? Andrew Gibson. Yeah, so going back to what you said earlier about not putting people in buckets um, in terms of like income, age, education level, but actually going out and observing what, what they're doing um, before you can make those determinations. This is kind of a selfish question. I'm, uh, I'm working for a uh, 
healthcare company that helps employers reduce um, cost of care uh, for their employees. And so we're having kind of an internal argument about, well, do we target people? Uh, some people are of the opinion that we target people who don't make a whole lot of money. So we target manufacturing firms, uh, blue collar workers, because they're more likely to go to a value-based provider. Or some people say, well, in fact, they don't have the same kind of education level um, that people at services firms do, who may be more likely to adopt this technology and use it. And some people say, well, we need to go after younger or employers with younger populations um, that you know are used to using apps, or or you know it's just sort of more built into their um, like sort of millennial culture. So. How do you, when you're having those types of arguments and you don't even, you're not even sure what your target market might be, how do you go out and test and observe tactically without you know, going through the process of pitching a company, onboarding them, and then finding out at that point that the adoption rate's low and having to, to find out the market? Rate? So, You got to go out and figure out who your customers are, who they likely are. You've got to go out and drink with them, go to their bars. Um, go. What, what do they care about? Or go go to their kids' soccer games on Saturday and Sunday, where you'll actually meet a lot of them. Um, and I, just usually, you can you can uh, if your company already already has customers. Quite often, the customers are actually delighted to help you. If you say, you know, we're interested in trying to help the health of your employees, but we really need to understand how, you know, what they care about. Uh, would you like to be part of an initial st uh, study with us? You, my experience is that some companies are very protective, but a lot of companies are delighted that you might actually be doing something that they care about. So they're actually quite help, quite happy to help you make a better product that will be better for them. Uh, we found this with customers all along, by the way. We ask customers to help us improve the product. They just love to give us their opinions and to work with us. Um, and, and again, you have to be careful that you, can't, you don't want to promise anything because you don't know yet what you're going to do. And you have to be careful you're going to be sensitive to proprietary information or to the uh, privacy of the people you're talking to. But I have a feeling that you might be surprised when you talk to the wide variety of people that, um, I again, I'm a fan of the activities people do and that's not because I'm a fan of it, it's because I've observed it over time. And I used to start off looking at the standard demographics uh, and I just didn't think that fit. Uh, the people's real interests in either behavioral change or buying patterns. Um, that it's interesting. It, it, you know, and in every group of people you will study, there will be smart ones and there will be dumb ones. <laughs> and, uh, it's uh, so it's, it's you really can't say, oh, you know, the people, the workers here are not as well educated. Well, that may be true. That doesn't mean they're not as intelligent. So again, I think you, you just have to work hard to figure out how to get to them. And the ideal way to get to them is, by the way, get to them in their normal activities. So uh, maybe in a company, it's you're gonna, have, you're gonna go into the mess hall, wherever they eat lunch and have lunch with them. And, um, and I'm serious about going out to the bars and drinking with them. Now, the, the only problem with going to the bars and drinking with them is that's a special uh, segment of the population. Those who tend to be the, the young unmarried ones, um, and or maybe the old unmarried ones, <laughs> not the ones with. It's not the vast majority that are probably the middle, which is the ones with families. Uh, but there they have family activities. Well, first of all, you'll find them in the supermarkets, and you'll find them at the shopping malls, and you'll find them on in the soccer games and the football games and the little league games. All right, uh, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, Victor Velasquez. Thanks. <clears throat> Hi, 
Um, I have a question. Uh, previously, when you were presenting, some of the things that you stated is that marketing focuses on what people buy, while designers uh, focuses on what people need. So um, my question here is, how can we balance both things? Uh, and uh, in, at the beginning of your presentation, you were stating that this product that Apple developed. But so this, this product that was developed was ahead of its time. Well, I mean, like they were focusing on what people were needing, but at the end of the day, the people wasn't buying. But I wasn't buying this product. So the development of this product was seen a flaw on the design thinking process because at the end it didn't, it, it wasn't bought. Uh, can you please? I'm sorry, what, what product was that? Uh, the, the product, the camera that you were explaining before uh, right. of, of Apple that was meeting a need of a consumer but at the end was a failure because it, it didn't sell, it, nobody bought it at the end of the day, but it was ahead of its time. Was it a flaw of a design thinking process to, to bring this drug to market? No. Um, actually, you have to realize that the, the methods we talk about today, the human-centered design method, the design thinking methods, didn't exist in those days. Uh, we were just we were struggling to do that. But, um, When you're bringing out a radical new product, uh, it's not obvious how you test it. It's not obvious how you find out what people's needs are. Apple had talked to a fair number of people, contractors and business people and so on, who really thought this would be wonderful, that I can take a picture, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in construction, we're building this apartment house and we always run into problems and we have to call up the architect and have big debates and they have to come and visit us because we can't explain to them what we're talking about. Wouldn't it be nice to take a picture and just send it to them? So the need was really there. Now, the problem was it was a relatively small niche market. They hadn't, the people didn't realize, <laughs> you know, more pictures are taken today on the cell phones than have ever been taken in the whole history of photography. And who would have thought, who would have thought that we uh, selfies would become popular? I don't know how you ever predict that. Um, in retrospect, it's easy to understand, but it's always easy to understand something after it's happened. Uh, so when you're trying to, when you're doing these radical things, um, it's really hard. I don't think you can succeed. I, in fact, when I look at the, if I want to know how innovative a company is or how innovative a designer is, I want to know how many times have you failed. If you haven't been failing, then you're not very innovative. That means you're not pushing the boundaries. And um, so failing at the... The real question, I think, about the Apple's camera is when it was not succeeding, what should they have done? Could they have repackaged it in a way that would hit, that would be great for the niche market and not for the mass consumers until that niche market grew? Uh, should they have stayed in the business, in which case they would be the leader, they would have been the leader in digital cameras? Or was it right to say, no, nope, sorry, this is not where we want to be today, let's quit? And I don't know the answer to that question because I think you can give really good logical arguments about why it was, yeah, you tried, it wasn't the right time, get out of the business, don't waste your money. Or, yes, you should really stay in, but you can lower the investment, but keep that product there because that way you'll be enhancing your own skills and when, when the time is ripe, you will be the world leader. It's a, it, there's, you know, that's why it's so much fun working in these great innovative uh, areas because there are no no methods, there are no correct answers. Well, um, thank you so much for making all this time for us, Professor Norman. It, it's been an honor. Thank you again. Thank you. Well, thank you.
and good luck with your careers. Bye.